Hello, my name is Jeff Geary. I'm a research associate for beef cattle programs here at Dean Lee Research and Extension Center. I wanted to talk to you about internal parasites in beef cattle and how we might approach control in a different way than what we are used to. Uh, internal parasites can be detrimental to producers uh, nationwide. Uh, the numbers nationally that are spent on control are in the low billions, uh, and that's for products to treat with as well as uh, weight loss, uh, weight gain loss in cattle. However, producers in the southeast are especially uh, affected, and one of the reasons why is because we have a nearly year-long grazing season here. Uh, with the aid of winter forages, we're able to plant and graze almost year-round. There's not many months that we can't do that. Another reason is our favorable weather conditions here allow for sustained populations of, of uh, nematode and parasites. And so both of those factors coupled together, we have uh, a, a prime way of picking up a lot of parasites and uh, it's, it's very significant. So the effects of, of parasites, uh, there's a couple of different um, ways to look at this, twofold actually. Clinical infections are the infections that we see in cattle that are way far along. We see weight loss, anemia, diarrhea, even death. Uh, and, there's, and on the side of that, there's subclinical effects that we don't see. These are the effects from weight loss and from uh, low milk production, lower pregnancy rates, things such as this that are, don't appear up front. They're hidden or sometimes delayed. And these are really the ones that cost us economically, uh, especially in young cattle. Uh, the slide that you're looking at now is a, is a study where uh, stalker calves are growing. The, the steers on the left have been treated for nematode worms, for uh, gastrointestinal worms. The steers on the right have not been treated. What you're going to see is those on the left have grazed their forage down almost to the ground. Those on the right, there's still forage available. And this is due to uh, the fact that uh, worm burdens or worm infections can suppress appetite, especially in young animals. Uh, and one of the ways that they're more susceptible to the worms is that young cattle have not had a chance to develop immunity yet. Sometimes uh, as, as, the, as the older cattle, uh, it can take up to a year, sometimes two grazing seasons for young cattle to develop the type of immunity that they, uh, that they need to have. Uh, all cattle are going to have parasites at some point throughout their life. Um, but however, the, the ability to resist or to, uh, to have immunity helps them fight to ward off these infections. So what type of, uh, uh, what type of, so let's talk about the different types of uh, parasites. Uh, and then what I want to focus on today is really gastrointestinal worms or stomach worms. Those parasites that affect the stomach and the intestines in cows, as well as the liver fluke. Uh, what I'm going to do is, is, looking at this slide, I'll describe the life cycle of the nematode uh, or the stomach worms, and then we'll talk about the liver flukes. So nematodes, generally, most uh, all of them have the same life cycle. Basically, if we start in the cow with adult, uh, with adult parasites, they shed eggs and it's deposited on the pasture in the feces. Uh, uh, in a matter of time, these eggs will hatch, and with uh, the right amount of rainfall and temperature, these larvae can enter uh, water droplets on the grass uh, where they are ingested by cattle that are grazing, and the process begins all over again. They find their way to their favorite spot in the cow. So what essentially happens is uh, at the point where they're re-ingested, the parasites begin to find their favorite place in the animal in the intestines or the stomach and they begin to inhibit themselves in the lining of the stomach or the intestines and they just they destroy the lining. What this does is affects the ability of the animal to absorb nutrients, to pro process and metabolize proteins. Uh, they, there is uh, uh, there's leakage as well as inflammation, and these things can cause short-term as well as long-term uh, factors in that ability for that animal to grow. Uh, so let's talk about liver flukes just a second. Liver flukes are a lot larger parasite. A matter of fact, the adult parasites uh, you can see, you can hold in your hand. So the liver flukes have a longer life cycle, even though it's very similar, uh, with the addition that they need a secondary host. Uh, in, in a mud snail. So what happens is adult liver flukes that are in the bile ducts of the liver shed eggs, they're deposited also through the feces on the pasture. Um, it takes a little bit longer for these to hatch out. When these larvae hatch out of these manure piles, they're searching for this, this mud snail, which is, uh, which is found a lot on the edges of ditches and pastures that are poorly drained. 
Uh, they like these areas and these warm climates. Once they've infested the snail, they'll sit there in the snail for about another six weeks. It takes them a little while to develop. They're back on the grass, similar to the nematodes, and they're ingested again by the cattle who eat, and they end up in the, uh, in the, uh, in the bile ducts of the liver. Now the whole life cycle for the liver fruit can be up to 18 to 20 weeks. It just takes a little while longer. So knowing these life cycles helps us work with veterinarians and scientists uh, on appro appropriate treatment uh, protocols uh, that we want to do. Okay, so what do we do? We have the knowledge of the parasites and their life cycles. Uh, so it's obvious that we're going to have to have a parasite control program. What's new is that we're going to have to change the way that we've been doing this over the past uh, several years. Uh, no longer are we going to be able to treat every animal every time, multiple times a year. Uh, and the reason that is is because there's anthelmintic resistance. And what that basically is is the ability of the parasites now genetically to resist the effect of the dewormers. It just doesn't kill some of the parasites. Uh, that population of those parasites will continue to grow if we keep doing some of the things, th same things that we're doing. Oh. So one of, the, one, of the, uh, one of the ways that we need to establish a good control program, and it's going to be multifaceted, we have to have focus on the animal, uh, we have to have focus on the grass or the pasture, and we have to be focused on the product. And so the way we're going to do that, one of the things we have to keep in mind is this resistance. One of the things that is recommended now by veterinarians and parasitologists and animal scientists is the idea of refugia. Refugia is basically the, the, a population of worms or parasites that we're giving refuge to. In other words, we're not going to treat them. We're going to allow them to miss a treatment. Uh, so how are we going to do that? Uh, well, basically, they're going to not be treated, and that can be accomplished in several ways. And I won't go into great detail, but there's three main ways that they can have refuge from this treatment. One is that we just simply don't treat some animals. And there is a logical way to work through which ones that we treat and which ones that we don't treat. But that's kind of something that we choose to do as producers. The second thing, environmentally, there are worms already that have refuge. And when you bring your cattle into the chute and deworm, there are still parasites on the pasture that have not been ingested. They're in a different, they're lagging behind, they're starting to hatch out. But as of now, they're on the pasture. They're not going to get treated. And there's a third type, and these are parasites, and usually in a larval stage, that are inhibited in the animal that are not going to be treated. In other words, they're not susceptible to the product to start with, or if perhaps we have underdosed that animal and there was not enough uh, of the active ingredient to kill. So there are different ways that the, there is refuge for some of these animals, and we can talk in more later in detail on how to, on how to do that. Okay, so practically... What can we do? How are we going to approach this with this idea of resistance and this idea of not treating worms? It it's really seems counterintuitive when we first think about it. Uh, so there's a couple of big main points that, that I'd like to convey to you. Number one, you're going to have to work with your veterinarian. Uh, also, you can consult extension specialists uh, at the Ag Center, uh, agents to help you, guide you, and to give you pointers. Uh, but always work with your veterinarian uh, because this is really a multifaceted approach and it's very unique to your own situation. Whatever you're doing at your ranch is not going to be the different from a neighboring ranch or for somebody down the road. So some main points are, one of the things we can take advantage of is this idea of, of counting the number of worm eggs uh, in manure called fecal egg counts. It's basically taking manure samples, getting into your veterinarian, let them analyze these to establish how many worm eggs are being shed. And this gives us an idea of what's going on in the cattle. Now you can't do just one or two animals, you're going to have to do 10 to 20 percent of your whole herd, obviously depending on how many. And if you can track the ID of these cattle, that's very good and we kind of know what's going on. Uh, with that, once you've established uh, what's going on as far as uh, shedding of worms, then you're going to do a treatment and then you can come back later, at least by two weeks, fecal those animals again and see how effective the treatment was. And uh, obviously you can hone this down with your veterinarian uh, to, to where you can establish some kind of protocol to, to understand what's going on on your place. The second thing is to focus on young animals. Uh, as I mentioned before, young animals are the most susceptible. Uh, we need to focus on them. Once you've separated replacements out, replacement heifers are in their own group, you still have to deal with the idea of resistance. They also are susceptible to flukes and susceptible to stomach worms. And so you, you have to establish how you're going to work these things out. 
Uh, also, on those that are animals that are poorly uh, doers or they're uh, nutritionally compromised, they're stressed, these are not somebody that you want to skip uh, the deworming on. Okay, and lastly, uh, one thing that's being recommended by veterinarians and parasitologists is the idea of treating cattle with two different classes of dewormers. Uh, each dewormer uh, class has a different mode of action, and when we combine two different ones, we uh, are able to uh, be successful uh, more than we were just using one. We, we get animals that may be susceptible to one dewormer and not to another. And so this is something that, uh, that they're recommending that we do. Obviously, you want to do this under the recommendation of your veterinarian. I want to talk just a second about products for flukes because this is where we get a little bit confusing. And here in the south, especially in the Red River Basin, uh, we are very prone to having fluke infections. Uh, the thing is, there is not one single product that treats flukes only. Uh, there are a couple of ingredients that are effective against flute. One is chlorsalon uh, and the other is albendazole. Chlorsalon and ivermectin uh, are found together uh, in, in products like uh, Ivermec F, uh, Ivermec Plus. Uh, also the albendazole, which is the active ingredient in valbazin, are also effective against flukes. So if we're talking about strategic deworming and not deworming some clouds and what cows and watching for this, this idea of uh, resistance, then we have, to be, we have to know that anytime we treat for flukes, we're going to be treating also for worms. So that also has to be a consideration. So in closing, the bottom line is we want to curb these economic, uh, these short-term economic factors. We want to treat cattle, we want to treat our young cattle, the sick ones, and we want to try to be sustainable in the long run, making these dewormers last longer because there's nothing new uh, really on the, on the, on the horizon uh, in the short term. Uh, also, I'd like to mention that uh, if you go to uh, the Ag Center's YouTube livestock page, there are presentations there that have to do with other uh, areas of um, research and uh, beef cattle. And uh, on the YouTube webpage, there is a, there's a real good presentation by Dr. Christine Navarre that goes into more detail about refugia, about uh, anthelmintic resistance, and about how to implement some of these programs. So thank you for watching.